Welcome to the Faith Lutheran Church Lenten service on March 9th, 2016. Tonight, Pastor Jonathan Holmes continues our Lenten sermon series, The Book of Job, Blessed Be the Name of the Lord, with a message entitled, Sweet Surrender, based on Job chapter 1, verse 13 to 22. Let's listen in. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, as I told you as we gathered together at the beginning, you get me now. The guy with the... I'm going to use bad grammar here. The funnest part of the entire book of Job. See, there's nothing but death and destruction. Job loses his entire estate. Not just his estate, but his own children. But you see, Job's story is one story that cannot be understood with simple human reason. It's impossible, because with human reason, we look at this story and we have to go, what did Job do to deserve this? That's what we want to ask, isn't it? Because there is always cause and effect. I will take back the simple human reason. The only way you can understand Job is through Murphy's Law. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. We could say Job is the epitome of Murphy's Law. But let's look at the destruction. All his oxen and donkeys are stolen by Sabians. All his sheep are burned up by fire that falls from heaven. I don't know if any of you have seen that before. I haven't. But I'm pretty sure that's not something that happens every day. <laughs> then all his camels are stolen not by one, not by two, but three groups of Chaldeans. And then all ten, ten of Job's children are crushed to death when at the one brother's house the roof falls upon them and their lives end. Though it's not in this chapter, but in the next chapter you'll also find out that Job then ends up losing all of his health as well. See, up to this point, God has said, don't touch Job, but take everything away from him. And then when Job is unwavering, God says to Satan, go ahead, take his health, touch him. Everything that can go wrong is going wrong for Job. And even when we hear about these scenarios, we come to find out that it's not just the animals, but also the servants, people themselves, who are killed and murdered. Put yourself in Job's shoes, if you can. You would think Job would be depressed, and he is. But you think Job would curse God and die. Because all he has left at this point are his wife, his three friends, and God. And as you look through the book of Job, you find out that the friends are not exactly the best of friends. Nor is his wife who tells him to curse God and die. All he has left now, truly, is God. But it certainly doesn't feel that way, does it? I mean, we know what's going on here. Job is being tested, his faith is being tested, because we have the words at the very first part of this chapter. We have the words that say, Have you considered my servant Job? Test him. But Job doesn't have that, now does he? So a question arises, what did Job do to deserve this? The answer is absolutely nothing. 
He did nothing. In fact, we're told right at the end of chapter 1, in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. He did nothing to deserve this. But he did everything. You see, we must understand this through the lens of original sin, our doctrine of original sin. Where it's not just that we are corrupted, the flesh is corrupted, but the entire creation. You see, bad things happen, don't they? Even to people that don't deserve it. Though, I should say, we all deserve it because we are sinners. And we struggle through life. I was telling a couple of you before that I'm from Minnesota most recently. Being from Lancaster, born and raised, all that fun stuff. But one of the reasons I had to leave Minnesota was because of very severe depression. In fact, I was suicidal at one point. But you see, God uses our sufferings. You see, suffering is going to do one of two things. It's either going to destroy you, or you let it destroy you, or you die thinking this is it, or you let it define you that this is the only thing that people will know me by, such as some people only know me because of my depression, or you let it develop you. You see, this third option is what suffering does for the Christian. See, we as Lutherans have this theology of the cross, where we bear our crosses, don't we? I mean, there are some people that are out there that don't suffer, but I've never met one. I'm sure all of you can think of a time in your life where you were wondering... God, where are you? But we've come out stronger at the other end, haven't we? As a pastor, I find that my depression has made me much more compassionate, a much better preacher, so a much better pastor than I was before, more understanding, more patient. And I know that's what God does for you too. You may be struggling right now too and you don't see the end of the, tu of the tunnel, but let me assure you, those three things I talked about, dis destruction, defining, developing, Christ has done that to you. You see, He has destroyed you in your baptism. The old Adam he destroyed that old Adam. He drowned him. He held him under for the count of three. Through Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As his arms are wagging in the air, they finally come back to the side dead. But the new, the new person has arisen from that death. For you see, that is what Jesus' death and resurrection means to you. For you have been baptized into that same death and resurrection. So you are baptized into forgiveness, life, and salvation. And through that baptism, you have been defined. Because you are now defined not as a person lost among all that is going wrong, all the darkness that this is. But you are called His child. A child in the light of Christ. You see, He calls you by name. In fact, while you were in your mother's womb, He knitted you together. That's how special you are. And He continues to develop you. Would you remember your baptism? When you hear God's word preached and spoken to you, and you hear the words, your sins are forgiven. 
when you partake of His Holy Supper. You see that body and blood in, with, under, whatever word you want to use to describe it, in that bread and wine is given for your forgiveness, is shed for your forgiveness. Is a food that gives life. Just as we eat foods developed through this life, develop our muscles, we are developed spiritually as well through that food. See, all these gifts have been given to you freely, without any merit or worthiness in you. Even though you may struggle with being sinned against or with a sin itself, God is there. That's why He's given you this place. Why He's given you a pastor. Well, <laughs> my apologies. <laughs> but you know what I mean. He gives you a pastor to forgive your sins. In fact, if your pastor is not forgiving your sins, you need to call him on it. Because that is His job. To forgive you your sins. Because He baptizes, He preaches, He administers the Lord's Supper for you. In the stead of mind, the command of His Lord Jesus Christ, He does those things for you. God has given you all good things. Yes, we've been looking at Job through this Lenten tide, and we see where we are to repent. But you see, when Jesus and even John the Baptist were preaching repentance, they were also preaching forgiveness. You see, even though Job doesn't have anything specific to point at for getting what he had or didn't have, God still forgives him his original sin. In fact, he who knew no sin became sin on your behalf. That, my brothers and sisters in Christ, makes all the difference in the world. Because your sin is no longer yours. That's why we have confession, but then absolution. Where we confess that we are fallen sinful human beings. Even when something is bothering our conscience, we still have that private confession where we go to the past and we say, I've screwed up here. But he doesn't say, go do this, go do that. No, he says, you, insert name, are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ, who died for you and rose for you, defeating sin, death, and the devil, when you could not. Yes, we see all this death and destruction with Job right now. But if you get to the end, you'll find out how much better of a life Job will have. He will have a hundredfold of what he had before. He will have ten more sons and daughters. He will have thousands upon thousands of animals. You see, that is the abundance of God's love. While it may not be abundance in money and animals in this life, at Lent, we don't just look to Good Friday, do we? We look to Easter. We look towards that glory of heaven that is promised to us in our own resurrection. That, my brothers and sisters in Christ, is what you have to look forward to. So even though as Lent goes along and it seems like it's nothing but repent this, repent that, remember, you are forgiven. You have been made righteous through the blood of the Lamb. So go in peace knowing that your sins are forgiven and that you can live a life boldly now on this earth. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Midweek Lenten Sermon from Faith Lutheran Church in Moorpark, California. For more information, visit us on the web at faithmoorpark.com. Dot com.